Well, good morning, church. I hope you had a great Christmas. And here we are, the last Sunday of the year. And it's not only a year that is ending, it's a decade that is ending. We're starting a new decade. And before we go into our sermon this morning, I just feel in my spirit um, to encourage some of you. I feel that perhaps there are some of you who feel that you blew 2019. Maybe there are some of you that have regrets about 2019. And I want, to, I want to encourage you to the fact that God's mercy are new every morning. So every, every day is a new mercy and every year is a new opportunity as well. You know, there's an old song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look, look full into his wonderful face. And all the things of earth will, go, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So for 2020, let's look at Jesus. Let's pursue Jesus. I believe there will be a breakthrough and areas of victory in our lives as we continue pursuing him with all our hearts. Amen? Okay. Now, we are in 1 Corinthians. Uh, for, the, for the past several weeks, we have been going through chapter by chapter. And now we are in 1 Corinthians 8. Uh, for the next few weeks, we'll go into a theme uh, that we have uh, titled Freedom in Christ. And let me start this sermon by telling you something about me that you might not know. I have been married twice with the same woman. I married twice the same woman. <laughs> All right. Let me tell you why. Because she's just so awesome that I had to marry her twice. <laughs> she's beautiful and amazing. Well, the truth is that I'm from Colombia, and all my 60 uncles and aunts and plus cousins and friends, they all not, couldn't come to America, so we had a wedding in Colombia, the picture that we have there, right, in June 2nd, 2007, and then three weeks later, we had the official wedding, like you have the picture here, in June 23rd, 2007, um, so we, we had the official wedding here in America. But there was something different about those two weddings. We didn't have a, a, a dance floor for our guests to dance in our Colombian wedding. We had one here in our American wedding. Why? Because you guys are crazy. American people are crazy. <laughs> well, as you might know, you know, Colombian people, we love to dance. We have rhythm in our veins. We need to dance and move. And I think you think I think Karen has some Latin blonde hair as well. She loves to dance. It's okay to dance in church, okay? It's, it's okay. Um, but for the most part, in the Latino culture, a lot of the dancing and, and, and you know, the party thing has a sensual tone to it, and there's a lot of drinking added to it. So the Christian believers, the Christian community, in order to um, kind of separate themselves or forget that old life, they usually don't dance at a wedding. Uh, even if it's a, a nice Christian setting, they don't dance at a wedding. So here in America, I have learned to enjoy a, you know, a slow dance with my wife, you know, romantic dance, and there's, it's a clean, it's nice, it's fun. So I was thinking about this. Should I have a loud dance in my Colombian wedding? It was my wedding after all, right? I, I, you know, that's my right. Uh, was I a hypocrite for not allowing it? So I think the Apostle Paul kind of faced a similar dilemma when we read 1 Corinthians 8, there were some believers that were thinking that it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols. Others felt that it was not okay to eat or not to eat, to dance or not to dance. So what's the Christian thing to do? So let's read 1 Corinthians. Let's stand. We can read it on the screen, in your Bibles, on your phones. 1 Corinthians 8. It says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, 
from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care of this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence here. And Lord, as we go through this passage of Scripture, we ask that you give us um, discernment and understanding, and that may our hearts grow in, in loving you and know how to express and live out our Christian freedom. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so Paul opens up with a great statement aimed at this, to disarm different sides of opinions that was happening here in the Corinthian church. And by doing so, he lays out a foundation for the rest of the chapter. I'm sure the Corinthians here, they wanted a plain answer. Is it okay or is it not okay? Are we right? Are they wrong? But Paul first goes to the heart. In verse 1 we read, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant or puffs up, but love edifies. You know, for some, the knowledge that Christ came to fulfill the law and that our salvation is not based on regulations or, or rules that we follow, or that, or that we can keep, but on the merits of Jesus Christ alone. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse um, 8 and 9, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And this is 100% true, that we are saved by faith alone, not by works. But perhaps... There were some who were going to the extreme and began to embrace a libertarian uh, position, which pretty much said that you can do anything without regard on how it affects your body or others because Jesus set us free from the law. For others, it was a knowledge that one should live a holy life separate unto the Lord and free from the stains of the world. In 1 Peter verse 1, 15 and 16, we read, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. <coughs> this is also 100% true. We should live a holy life. But perhaps there were some who were also going to the extreme and began to embrace legalism which sought to keep so many regulations and specific codes of conduct, thinking that it was necessary in order to, to show you know, spiritual maturity or even keep salvation. All of these range of opinions here in Corinth were not just sharing knowledge or opinion. They were judging one another. They were pressuring one another for not being on the right side of things, Their point of view was the correct. Oh, we are the spirituals and the mature ones because we are free to eat whatever we want. Or, no, we are the spirituals and mature ones because we keep ourselves from all the things in the world. That knowledge, that position, that opinion made them arrogant, puffed up, led them to pride, which caused division and strife in the relationship of the church. Well, what about us? All of us have here have some type of knowledge, preferences, or opinions. Perhaps that can puff us up and lead us to pride. 
you know, how we share our knowledge, how we share our opinion or how we come across it can be arrogant sometimes and prideful. Paul reminds us that, Paul, that love builds up. We should choose love over knowledge. So notice the way Paul disarmed their strong opinion. First, we read in verse 2. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. As if he's saying, really? Really, you know that much. Oh, you are so wise. Look at you. You are so smart and spiritual. Most likely, we don't know fully or we don't know it at all. We should be careful how we come across to people that differ from us. We might have a strong opinions, a strong you know, knowledge. We have maybe accumulated great experiences, but we should be careful how we come across. Paul encourages us to acknowledge that we are still in the process of learning. In this journey in the Lord, we are still learning. There's so much more. There's so much more to know about God. We should never put God in a box. You know, have we pondered and considered what it means, for instance, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places? There's so much more to know about Him, about experiencing a relationship with Christ. You know, the fact that we are called children of God, is so much deeper than we have experienced even until now. We should never put or limit our Christian experience by what we experience in this service. Christianity and the Christian experience is greater than this 9.15 to 10.30 Sunday morning. It's much more. God is beyond our finite understanding. So Paul not only questions their complete knowledge, but also reveals the truth that at the end of the day is not how much you know up in your head, but what or whom you love. Because we will always show with our actions what we love, whether it's knowledge, food, gadgets, travel, sports, Jesus. Verse 3 he says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. I really love how Paul reverses the whole concept of knowledge. Again, it is not how much knowledge, you know, for the sake of knowledge you can have, but knowledge that starts and flows and grows out of love. Well, to know is to love, you may say, but how come there are so many professors of religion and theology that are atheists? Knowledge does not equate to love all the time. And the reality is this. America is full of people that attended church or went to Sunday school and even went to youth group for years, but what they learned didn't result in a passionate love for the person of Jesus Christ. It was only religion. Head knowledge alone is vain, my friends. What we hear, what we learn in church, the songs that we sing, even if we open the Bible and read whatever activities we do in church, if it doesn't produce love, devotion to the person of Jesus, it is all vain. It is all a waste. Have we asked ourselves lately, how much do I love Jesus? How much do I love God? Do I truly love the person of Jesus? That's what Paul says here, if anyone loves God, he's known by him. Because that's the core of being a devoted follower of Jesus. It's not the regulations to keep or, or uh, how, how much knowledge you can have, though it is good to have some knowledge, but it's how much love you have for this person of Jesus. When we love, our time and energy, our devotion, our passion will revolve around him. Everything else is secondary. Everything else will have its place and becomes an outflow of his love for Jesus. And when we love him, it says that we will be known by him. You know, John 14, 23 says that when we know the Father, when we keep his word, the Father and the Son will come and make his abode in us, will dwell in us. That's amazing that he would know me, that he would decide to know us, that he would see us. Because we love him. So love for God was vital back in Corinth. 
as a backbone to express their Christian freedom, to grow into maturity, to bring unity. So I think it's important also for us. So now that Paul has framed this knowledge under the lens of love for God, he continues into a second aspect of what he is trying to deal with this church in Corinth, in verse 4 to 8, in the area of gods or idols. He says, therefore, concerning things, eating things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol, and there is no God but one. Okay, so let me describe the setting. And we can put the picture here in Corinth, so we know what is going on in this particular city. Corinth was a city with many, many temples. The most important one, at the hill, the Acre Corinth, a temple to Aphrodite. But around the city market, there were other temples and to other gods, such as Hermes, Poseidon, Apollo, and many other deities around the main market of the city. And after sacrificing an animal in front of the temple, people would save it, some of them would eat it, so some of them would uh, uh, sell it to vendors who would resell it in the market. So now the temple, according to scholars, it was not just a place for the strict pagan worship, but many other buildings were also found around the temples and other rooms that were used for public gatherings, for civic meetings, for places to celebrate weddings and uh, birthday parties and all kinds of activities. And many of those activities offered food that came from that area of temple and sacrifice of animals and other food. So one interesting thing is that what we would consider restaurants today, well, they were actually around the temple. The restaurants of the time in Corinth, it was around the temple. So you can imagine how many Christians um, were kind of... Um, struggling how to interact with the world around them. Because if they were going to be invited to a birthday or to a wedding or to a part of, be part of a meeting, they will have to go to these places around the temple where we had food that came from places of being sacrificed. So how can they, you know, interact with the world around them? You know, they have a new faith in Jesus. How can they be separated to the Lord but with, within their context, within their culture? And Paul brings clarity in two ways. First, he points to, this, to the so-called gods. In verse 4, he says, There is no such thing as an idol, no God but one. You know, Paul brings peace to the over Christian in Corinth who feels that idols somehow still have some power. Because idols, in reality, are nothing. You know, they are man-made myths. Images, deities that, empowered by the devil, keep people deceived from the truth. The truth is that there is one God, as revealed in the scripture. Amen? One God in three persons. Let me tell you a story. Some years ago, I was with my wife in Africa. We were doing a, an outreach in the northern part of Mozambique. And with our team, we were in a truck and going through different villages. And we slept in tents. And we, uh, in some locations where we, they had a church, we would go there to encourage believers. In some locations where they don't have a church, we would preach Jesus for the first time. And in this particular place, uh, we spend the night, we, put, we set up our tents, and we went to, you know, to sleep. In the middle of the night, we begin to hear these loud drums. Boom, 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 boom. Big, loud, you know, drums. And... It gets louder and louder and louder. It was like, oh my gosh, they're going to come get us. They're going to eat us. What can we do? We didn't want to peek out of the tent. <laughs> we were inside of the tent. And then it stopped. And then maybe 45 minutes later, it started again. It went on and off for the whole night. And then finally it stopped. Okay, we got up in the morning, come out of the tent. Everybody like questioning what, what happened. I wonder what, what, what's going on. We, we, we went, you know, on and on about our day, and we begin to hear the drum again. Boom, 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 boom. So crazy me, I tell my friend, let's just go find where the sound is coming from. So he goes with me, go, we walk through the bush to, towards the sound, and we find this group of people 
in a circle, and you can see there in that picture, um, and there's one room there, but they have other ones bigger than that. And it was actually a funeral for uh, an elder who died, and they were doing some rituals to appease the spirits of death and other, you know, spiritual beings so that that man could go into the afterlife and, and all that. I thought to myself, well, that's a perfect place to preach the gospel. <laughs> so after they stopped chanting and, and dancing and everything, I found that our driver was among them, you know, watching what, what, what was going on, and he could speak the language. So I asked him to translate for me. So I said, hey, guys, hey, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> could we just, you know, share something briefly with you? And they said, sure, you can. And I told them about this higher spirit, you know, the spirit of God. Their, their, their way of understanding the world is different from us, so I had to use words that you would understand. And at the end of the day, you know, to make a story short, I told them about Jesus, the gospel, and that we don't have to be afraid of death or other spirits because this Jesus is supreme over everything else. And that we can have an allegiance to him by receiving him, right? And you know, preach the gospel to them. And uh, I asked him if they wanted to forget those other little, you know, beings or spirits and follow Jesus. And he said, yes. My friend is a little crazier than me. I said, you know what? We should ask them to nail, to kneel on the, on the ground if they really want to follow Jesus. So like, oh, that's kind of too much. But <laughs> I said, okay, you, you tell them, you ask them and they'll run if they don't want to. Well, he, he actually does it, and then everyone kneels on the ground. And they had old people, young people, Muslims, and animistic individuals there as well. Only, I think, one person. Everybody else said yes to Jesus that morning. Because guess what? Jesus has no rival. Jesus is supreme. There is no other God but our God and our Savior, Jesus. You know, in India... There are over 30 million gods. And I'm wearing this Punjabi in support of my dear friends in Bangladesh and in India who are preaching the gospel in unreached, people, in unreached people groups. And they are using this time of Christmas to go to other villages, tell them about the birth of a Savior. And actually, I, I heard that there are some baptisms going on among new believers uh, from an unreached people group. So, praise the Lord for that. But Jesus is the real and only supreme God. You know, even Paul says that there are so-called gods and lords. Here in America, you know, we don't have images and deities like that. Um, but there are things that rule and lord over people, I think, sometimes. Entertainment. You know, hobbies and sports and things. And the American dream can be a mini-god for people. Our Lord Jesus, he's the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. He's ever-present. You know, he provides eternal hope for today and for tomorrow. You know, peace in our minds, in our lives. Because he cares, he loves, he heals, he restores, he's alive. And we should be encouraged to the fact that we, we are following the true living God. Now, Paul also reminds the Corinthian believers that true freedom is living for the, for the one true God who deserves glory. In verse 6, we read that... We exist for him. You know, we don't exist for our freedoms. We don't exist for, to follow regulations either. We exist for him. You know, how, how we ponder about the fact that we don't exist for ourselves. You know, we are not just chance that, you know, we just happen to be and then we have to, you know, make the best out of life and then one day cease to exist. No, we we, are, we exist for him. He made us. He gives us a, a purpose and a meaning and a destiny. And, and we don't exist for ourselves or for our future or for our money or for our happiness. We don't exist to pursue our happiness. We exist to pursue his glory. Let me say it again. We don't exist to pursue our happiness. We exist to pursue his glory. And then we'll be, we'll be completely satisfied and truly happy when we live for him. And also, Paul says that we exist through him. You know, the very breath that we breathe is 
by the power of Jesus. The Bible says that he, he sustains everything with the power of his word. He is the living word. Do you live by your own means? Do you live by, through your own power and ability? Are you trying to parent and are you trying to work and do life apart from the, from the source of true life found in Jesus? You know, that's why sometimes life, this boring life can be so monotonous because, and we feel empty inside because after all the promotions, after we have made it, we are doing life through our own means, through our own ability, no, through the power of Jesus. And even churchy things, that's what is deceiving. A lot of Christian activities can be done with our own power and through our own power, not through the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He is the living water. He is the bread of life. We are meant to do life. Exist through, empowered by, having the, this engine, this source of life and grace that is found in Jesus, living in us. So, so that we can do anything with, through, and by him. So Paul acknowledges that there are some in Corinth that are still struggling with that concept. In verse 7, we read, however, not all men have this knowledge. You know, many Christians there are first-generation believers. They are coming from generations of idol worship and, and pagan religious activities. And they feel that any interaction with food in the, in the temple area is as if they are worship, worshiping idols. And, and, and Paul describes that as having a weak conscience because as Paul said, idols are nothing. And also, he also said that food uh, will not commend us to God. It is not a mark of being super spiritual whether we eat or don't eat certain food. First Timothy 4.4 4 says that we can eat anything as we give thanks to the Lord because he created it. So it might seem that Paul is siding with the group here that, that, is say, that uh, believes that we can eat anything around the temple grounds, because as, he, as Paul said, there's no God, there's no idols, only, only God is a true God, and food is okay to eat. You know, he will not commend us to God, to, uh, to God. So, are the Corinthian believers truly free to do as they please? What about us? Are we free to do as we please because we are not bound by strict regulation of, of the law? What about with our friends, my brothers and sisters in Colombia, uh, is it okay for them then to dance at a wedding? Is it okay for us to drink alcohol? What about, is it okay to uh, listen to non-Christian music? Is it okay to watch whatever type of rating, type of movie? The same for us. We are free to please God, uh, but our freedom in Christ is, is not a license to sin. It's a, li it's, it's a freedom to... to, to uh, glorify God in our lives and in decision making. So, Paul leads us into the third point about our rights. We had first knowledge, second, God's, and now rights. He kind of goes into the nitty gritty of is it okay or not. And we read in verse 9, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. So Paul tells Christians in Corinth that they do have some liberties. They do have a genuine right because idols are nothing and because all food is good. However, since it is a matter of conscience, and this is what is important here, it's a matter of conscience, they should remember that love is more important than knowledge. Love is more important than rights. Because Paul warns them that their brother or sister might be led to stumble into sin. So the same for us. We are free to please the Lord. You know, we have been bought with the, we, at a price with the life and death of Jesus. And now that we belong to him, we are free, but we are free 
not as a, having a license to sin, but to follow him in pleasing him and having our conscience be led by the Lord. There's a man by the name of Vaughan Roberts, and he has a, what he calls a flowchart of Christian decision-making. And there's a, some of the questions that you can see. It's quite helpful. He says, does the Bible allow it? If, if the Bible doesn't allow it, then don't do it. Of course, like cheating, stealing, right? Lying. The Bible doesn't allow it. So don't do it. If the Bible allows it, or is not 100%, you know, gives you a, a strict rule of regulation or a boundary, it goes to a second question. Does my conscience allow it? If not, if not, if he doesn't allow it, well, then don't do it. There's no pressure for you to try to do it. But even as you think that you can do it, ask yourself three more questions. What's the effect on other Christians? What's the effect on non-Christians? And what's the effect on my spiritual life? And as the worship team comes up, let me clarify this. Please know that we are not to do or don't do things to please people. Christian freedom is not about pleasing people. And the same, we are not to do or don't do things to, in order to offend people or avoid offending people. That's not Christian freedom either. It's about a matter of conscience and preference in the area that might lead people to sin. That's what is important here for us to note. For question number one, what's the effect on other Christians? Verse 30 sums it up. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Give up that right. Give up that right for the sake of love. Love is more important than knowledge. You know, going back to uh, our wedding in Colombia, you know, my conscience now is, I don't think it was no big deal, right? But knowing that there are new believers and other believers that might stumble because of that opportunity, we refrain from that and we didn't have a problem. No problem at all for doing that. Your conscience might not tell you it is wrong. Your conscience might tell you it is okay to drink alcohol or a glass of wine or a, dr or a glass of beer occasionally. The Bible does not give us specific regulations in that area. Okay, no problem. But if necessary, lay down your right for the sake of your brother and sister who might be coming from a life that might lead him again to stumble or to sin. Because of love is more important than knowledge. Question two, what's the effect on non-Christians? So what are my actions telling people about the gospel? How does it affect my witness of the gospel? Because at the end of the day, the gospel is more important than our rights. You know, when we go with teams to different parts of the world, um, in some cultures, in order, in order to build a bridge, we have to come under the culture and we ask uh, our ladies in our teams that wear, to wear long skirts. Because in some African, we were in, in, in Mozambique, for them to see the knee is like you are naked. So we ask them to wear long skirts. And even when, to go to the beach, long pants and, and long, long uh, shirts. Because even though we know in our conscience it is okay to wear you know, regular clothes, for them, we want to build a bridge for the gospel so we can lay down our right for the sake of the gospel. Amen? And number three, what's the effect on my spiritual life? How is this decision, this activity, this hobby, this movie, whatever it is, going to impact my walk with the Lord? Because at the end of the day, our spiritual health is more important than our freedom. Now, remember... Though our conscience might say it's okay, we are not controlled by our conscience. We must submit to the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit must rule over our conscience so that we are not deceived and just begin to do whatever the heck we want. But we are to submit and be, uh, he must rule over our conscience. And because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and self-control, then we can lay down our rights for the sake of my brother and sister who might stumble, for the sake of the gospel, and for our own spiritual health. Because that's what true freedom in Christ is experienced. True freedom in Christ is expressed. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for giving us freedom. You said that uh, who the Son sets free, it's free indeed. And Lord, you bought us when you died on the cross. You rose back to, from the grave. We have victory and true life and abundant life in you. And Lord, uh, we thank you that we have your Holy Spirit to know and to discern. And Lord, uh, as we go through our life and our journey in you, maybe there are people around us uh, that we have to be mindful of. Not because, what, because we care what they are going to say or because we don't want to offend them, but because maybe they, uh, they might be led to sin. And we don't want them to, to be led to sin because we will be sinning against you. Lord, help us to, to love you more. Lord, let, let it be a resolution in 2020, God, that we would love you more. And by loving you more, loving those around us better as well. God, that we would learn to lay down our rights uh, for the sake of my brother and sister, for the sake of the gospel, and for our own spiritual health and growth. We thank you for your care and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.